Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> um, so I saw on Twitter today that um, 46 years ago today, Johnny Cash sat down with Richard Nixon to talk about prison reform. Um, and of course this year, Kim Kardashian did the same thing with President Trump. Um, but many celebrities like uh, Johnny Cash sort of have this, you know, an American dream. Like they started off with a hard life um, and they succeeded because of their talent. So do you think that celebrities like that have anything positive to contribute to our discourse? Well, it's a complicated issue. I just wrote a book about it. Uh, uh, yes, and I think ma many, uh, uh, Mark Twain, for example, in some ways was the first media celebrity in this country, was a great example of the American dream. He came out of nowhere uh, and became a world-renowned uh, author uh, and, and became very wealthy, then lost it all, then became wealthy again. And so, uh, but this creates a, a problem for celebrities. Uh, Ludwig von Mises, the great Austrian economist, wrote about this in his book, The Anti-Capitalist Mentality, because he was already speculating why are so many entertainers anti-capitalist, and he said, uh, much of what they achieve is because of luck, and they feel guilty about it. Uh, and I think a lot of what you see coming out specifically of Hollywood are the secret guilt feelings of people who've acquired great fame, great wealth, knowing that it often turns on just one little moment in their careers, or the genetic fact that they're so good looking. Uh, uh, and so this disposition, uh, to be often socialists and certainly anti-capitalists, I think can be traced to the fact uh, that they're aware that, uh, th that their f success isn't based on anything very solid. And of course it's also fleeting, and they live in fear of that. So it is a curious fact that so many of the beneficiaries of the American dream, and again, I'd say a lot of people in Hollywood stand for that, uh, are themselves very dubious about it and won't recognize the fact that uh, they've, uh, they've lived it out themselves. Are, 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 are you saying that Johnny Cash is better than Kim Kardashian? Just to, just to well, if forced, if, if forced, <laughs> I think he had a better voice, yeah. uh, and he also dressed better. The one thing I would say about the Kim Kardashian Kardashian scenario is, I think the reason she was able to weather it was she was able to tell the story of the woman that she was trying to help. And so I think when you look at celebrity and how they are trying to use their platform, you can see through whether or not people are doing it just to gain attention or whether there could be good intentions behind it. And I think that's what she played off well. She met with someone who she knew she was gonna get criticized for meeting with and then told the story of a woman she was trying to help and I think that's why it would say it worked, worked well in her favor in that situation. Some months ago I was at an airport lounge and I picked up the New York Times. Uh, it's the only place I ever look at the New York Times in print. And I opened it to the op-ed page to see what they were doing on their op-ed page. And the lead op-ed, was a piece on the Rohingya crisis, the refugees from uh, Burma, I guess we're supposed to call it Myanmar now. Uh, and the byline, if I recall correctly, was by Angelina Jolie and John McCain. <laughs> <laughs> and I just kind of rolled my eyes and I thought, all right, first of all, Angelina Jolie did not write this. Maybe John McCain did, but probably he had a staff of work on it. I mean, why do I want to read this piece by Angelina Jolie and John, ostensibly by Angelina Jolie and John McCain? I mean, it's just a silly gimmick. So I have a general. Uh, but you read it. No, I okay, read no, the no, byline. No. I saw what it was about. No, I didn't read it. I, I probably read former Enron advisor Paul Krugman instead. <laughs> I, so I have a general aversion to these kinds of pieces, and you won't see a lot of celebrity written op eds uh, on. Uh, on our page while I'm editing it. I did run one, which was by the singer Moby, uh, which I liked because it was about uh, food stamps. And he was arguing, I think he was arguing that food stamps shouldn't be, you shouldn't be allowed to use food stamps to buy junk food. But he was recounting his personal experience uh, growing up, living with a single mother and being dependent on food stamps. So there was, there was a certain authenticity there that I liked. And so I was happy to have, uh, have Moby in the page. But, I mean, the idea that we should pay attention to some celebrity's cause just because the person is famous uh, is one that I find somewhat vexing. Good. But uh, unlike a true political philosopher like Merle Haggard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
James, you said that uh, the daily news may be on its last legs, but you didn't give us a uh, uh, prophecy about the newspaper industry in general. I mean, is there a way for newspapers really to maintain their aristocratic status, or is the New York Times eventually going to be reduced to begathons like NPR? Well, the New York Times, I looked this up because I thought it might be relevant to, uh, to my talk here. Uh, New York Times stock has risen by about 150% since Election Day. So what that suggests, I mean, I haven't you know, looked at all the factors that might influence that. I, although I will say News Corp stock has risen considerably less. I think it's about 50%. That's the company that owns the Journal and the New York Post, among others. Uh, but it does appear that the Trump uh, insanity has been good for the New York Times commercially, at least in the short run. Now, to the extent that the New York Times depended on its, uh, has depended on its uh, reputation as the paper of record, as, you know, even though it's understood to be liberal, as at least attempting objectivity, uh, I think that it will harm them in the long run as an institution. But there's probably, a commercial market for at least a few newspapers, uh, but the, the the business in general, I think, is uh, is in trouble. And I don't, I mean, maybe somebody will find a new business model. I don't know exactly what it will be. But the journal is doing fine. I think uh, the journal will be all right at least until I retire. Good. <laughs> Good. Um, all right, in the back. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Kami, but I'm with the Pakistani Spectator. And my question is, what should be the real concern uh, of, uh, uh, should we concern that Democrat get some inspiration from Hollywood? Or what Hollywood teach should be the serious concern, like, you know, your little son could have two dad, or your little daughter could have two mommies. And if that is the real concern, then, you know, Department of State is full with 50% lesbian and gays, and that's what they reflect America outside, so as a being, uh, Muslim American or Pakistani American, I've been in this city for 35 years. I feel more concerned about those issues that these people are somehow right. destroying America okay, from so inside. The, so the question is about the culture that, that the media and Hollywood are teaching. Thanks. I'm happy to say a yeah, little bit ahead. on that. So what you see in Hollywood and what you see in movies putting out there, you can go back to probably the first TV show as far as showing gay couples, and that's Will and Grace. Um, and if you took, and I don't know what the number is, if you took the percentage of people in the country at that point and what they thought about gay marriage would be very different than what it is today. Um, so right or wrong, whether you agree with that or you don't, I do think that what people see in movies and what people see in TV definitely changes people's opinions of the issue as more time goes on. And, and it goes back to the power of seeing people and telling stories. And that's something that the left on many issues has been great at, which is, Let's, let's get you to think about an issue in a certain way because we're going to show you the people behind it. And so I even see when it comes to traditional news media that they are following that same form. I think the most recent immigration issue at the, at the border is a prime example where the main narrative was about visuals of children and talking to the families there. Not a thorough discussion on the nuanced aspect of the policy that was behind all this and just the history of immigration in general. So where I will fault the left on many issues, not that they tell stories, I think it's very effective, but that we don't have thoughtful, thorough discussion and social media is not helping with thorough discussion about anything. And when news media and even many newspapers are going to make a sensationalized narrative only showing one side of the issue, that's where we get ourselves into a lot of trouble. I will say on that, what I am encouraged by when it comes to technology and um, telling narratives is the explosion of podcasts. Who in here listens to podcasts? I'm sure a lot of people do. Love podcasts. I, I think in some ways the podcast culture is a reflection of us being frustrated by the short characters that we get. You think of sound bites and news packages that we saw on TV or even just Twitter. It's not many words to, to talk about an issue, so I'm very excited about podcasts and that even millennials are driven to them, probably because you can binge listen to them, which makes it a lot easier, and there are very few commercials, um, which is helpful, but also because I do think that we crave long-form discussion in a way that's conversational. Anything else? Uh, in the back. 
Right there. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was reading the New York Times a couple of weeks ago, and there's a headline here that I read. A jury may have sentenced a man to death because he's gay, and the justices don't care. Um, and I went on to read this. It's an opinion piece. I read the rest of the piece, and it turned out what happened was there was a gay man who committed a murder and was um, sentenced to death. And the author of the article argued that the jury was biased against the man because he was gay, uh, and therefore sentenced him to death. Um, so obviously there's sort of a misleading title there, that if you were scanning through the headlines and you read that, you might assume, oh, there are homophobic judges just sentencing people to death for homosexuality. Um, so could you speak a little bit on the idea of clickbait headlines, in a, especially in the context of so a publication like the New York Times that one would think would be a, a respectable institution? Is it well, I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> think that. <laughs> I mean, it, clickbait gets clicks. It happens. I think what's <coughs> probably the most infuriating thing is when you've written an article and somebody else picks it up and changes your title, which happens a lot. Um, there are recourses that people can take to ensure that that or try to make it so it doesn't happen again. Um, sadly, it's the nature of clicks mean more than sound journalism. And the only recourse, in my opinion, to that is people getting fed up with it. So I do think as we silo ourselves into, okay, I agree with this perspective, so I'm just going to go to this news outlet. I think if more and more people want straight journalism and just want the facts, that's when things change. But if there's an audience for the clickbait, it's going to continue. It is a market. You, a read market. It, you read the article. Yeah. And that's what they wanted to happen. And as all these print-based media also have online presences, they need those clicks. But isn't this also driving a desire to get things up very, very fast? Yes. And yes. isn't this what's killing the, the, the use of a need for two sources in the media? Yeah. I mean, well, what killed that? Well, I mean, I think the two source rule is not necessarily an especially good rule. You might just be getting one, one guy who hears it. <laughs> about, about, you might just be source. getting one guy who hears it from somebody else. I mean, sourcing is a whole, uh, a whole other story. Often you can have a story that's solidly sourced, but the sources have bias, and the journalists don't tell you uh, uh, what the sources are or how the sources are biased. I. Uh, my favorite is, so the New York Times uh, in particular does this. They decided they want to try to explain uh, why people are asking for anonymity. So you get these hilarious explanations, you know, blah, blah, blah said, a person who spoke on, 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 on request of anonymity uh, to avoid uh, offending, you know, the president or whatever. Well, the president's going to be offended. <laughs> uh, you know, it's... Often you look at this and you realize, oh no, it's the, the, the real reason is obviously self-interested, but it's framed as, in a, as, as a sort of high-minded way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, right here. Yeah. Hi, uh, so my question is, uh, given the way tr politics today, it's very tribal-like. And you know, my question is, given that also with social media, a lot of fake news, and you know, a lot of Americans kind of just given their preconceived notions of you know, politics, how do we grasp and articulate public policy that's going to be based on you know, actually providing people with you know, real facts and you know, thinking through these things and understanding you know, how liberal democracy works and how we can actually engage in actual debate that's based on you know, actual compromise? I'll jump in. This would be one of my big criticisms of the president in that he tweets so much that it takes all the airspace and all the media <laughs> loves to cover it. So we don't have thoughtful discussion, even like we used to before he was president, even though I'd say it was too limited, because these days that's more entertaining. He is entertaining. I even think he does himself a huge disservice because he'll cover good stories going on and then tweet something personally about someone, and then that becomes a story even though 
a great study came out about how tax reform is helping people, for example. Um, as far as how do we deal with the tribalistic aspect, I do think that Trump is a response to Obama. Um, people felt disillusioned by, by Obama, and so Trump was the alternative to that. Unfortunately, he's just continuing to I think dig in on tribalism. I think it comes from our leaders higher up. I think you can be a tough talker without being as divisive as the president can be with rhetoric. Um, so take his, his policies aside or good things that have happened in my opinion under his administration. It's the way we talk to each other and with each other. And when you have rhetoric that it is very divided and, and you just see both sides doing it now, you don't get anywhere and people just entrench themselves even further into their own perspective. So I think it starts with quality rhetoric, good rhetoric, um, and more airspace to be able to do that in the media. Yeah, I agree with that, that it is wrong to place all the blame for this on the American people and the new media. Let's face it, our politicians are abandoning their obligation uh, to serve the public good, and I put most of the blame on Congress. It is supposed to be a deliberative body. Uh, I'm old enough to remember the 1960s uh, when senators would get up and give thoughtful speeches and maybe even sway people with a good argument. Uh, and you know, you can go back through American history and read famous speeches by famous senators. And what a, we're gonna have, the Library of America is gonna do the collected tweets of Congress someday now. Uh, what is there left? Uh, they, uh, uh, so I, uh, to me, the biggest failure is in our legislature in its refusal to be a legislature and to talk seriously about, about these issues of what good policy is. I don't know, I'm gonna say a word on defensive, in defense of Twitter here. I, I mean, Wait okay. see my tweets back. <laughs> Sen senators gave thoughtful speeches in the 60s. I'm sure some of them were, uh, were very good. They were very nice and prosaic. Twitter is a sort of poetry. And I think there's something to be said for that, that sort of yeah. form. I mean, I love President Trump's I'm tweets. The they they entertain the hell out of it. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, I've met poetry, and Twitter is not poetry. <laughs> but isn't it interesting that some extent that uh, so it took a Donald Trump using Twitter to break through what seemed to be a, a monolithic liberal journalism, and now they're just reacting, they don't know what to do about it. Yeah. Mm. But that's what broke through. Isn't that useful? Well, and also the Republican establishment. I mean, Trump not only took down the Clinton dynasty, he took down the that, Bush dynasty right. first. So it was astonishing. My that's favorite, that's, that's yeah. useful. My favorite graphic on CNN as of late was last week on Finland just said outrage. Like they've run out of words <laughs> on how to describe what's going on. No, yeah. Trump has been brilliant and finding a way around traditional media. And I give him a ton of credit for that. He's a master of earned media. Like he is something to watch. His Twitter feed is entertaining. I mean, it's, it's like, what is he gonna tweet this morning? It's highly entertaining. It's captivating. Um, but I think there's backlash to it as he well. He steps on his own yeah. toes, but he, yeah. but he got around what he got heretofore around was an established uh, elite as we're talking about it. And I think what he's been able to do even more so is so as the left is more enraged by what he says and what it does on Twitter. Their antics increase, which then allows him to attack them even more. So Maxine Waters, obvious, right? the low, low IQ Maxine is what he calls her. And like, if you thought like he was Careful what you wish for, Max. <laughs> now that's poetic, come it's on. Poetic. So, but he wouldn't be able to take that tactic, I don't think, if they didn't match or exceed some of what he was already saying. So it's, it's almost as if they play into his hand because they're so outraged by what he's doing. So all they have to do is stop. And yeah. It doesn't work anymore. That's a right. simple, simple plan. <laughs> you, you, you've been waiting, so we'll come up here. I think it's question. Okay. Make it good. It, yeah, make it good. <laughs> no pressure. English professor here, make it good. <laughs> Arguably, one of the functions of aristocracy is the provision of narratives that legitimize the prevailing social order. Um, if Hollywood is the new aristocracy, does it provide, uh, well, does it manufacture or facilitate America's civic mythology, and does it do it well? 
you know, I would describe Hollywood as a false aristocracy, and indeed that was Twain's point about what he saw as aristocracy in America. Because, uh, you know, I don't want to go defend aristocracy, but the whole idea behind aristocracy was inherited wealth, inherited position, so that people could take the long-term view of things. Uh, and uh, that's exactly the opposite of our Hollywood aristocracy, which is, after all, awfully ephemeral. These stars come out of nowhere, and then they disappear. There was an old joke about, about how do you describe the career of a Hollywood star, and they use Hugh O'Brien, whom none of you have heard of, you young, but older people know he was Wyatt Earp, and the idea was you had the cycle of a Hollywood career, and who is Hugh O'Brien? Uh, uh, get me Hugh O'Brien. Get me a young Hugh O'Brien. Who is Hugh O'Brien? Uh, that all stars go through that cycle. So that we call it an aristocracy, it's a kind of metaphor. Uh, it really isn't an aristocracy. And in some ways, the last people in the world to take a long-term, broad-based view of the public good are people in Hollywood. So uh, I don't know where we could get a real aristocracy from, or even a reasonable facsimile of one. I'll just the last say, thoughts? Yeah, just one thing quickly on that is when you do have Hollywood commenting on social media, the facade kind of goes away. So I think as they talk more, insert themselves into politics, into whatever else, the magic of not knowing what's behind, like the, the silver screen, so to speak, goes away. So I don't think as they comment more, it helps them build up themselves as who we look to. I actually think it does the opposite. It also seems to me uh, they don't have the kind of, you don't have people with the sort of universal presence, universal influence they used to have. I think of Rob Reiner, for example, who's, you know, this nutty, like 70 year old approximately uh, actor uh, who posts these crazy tweets about, uh, about Trump. Now, a lot of people in the audience probably don't remember that 45 years ago, Rob Reiner was one of the uh, stars of a show called All in the Family that was, uh, you know, Tens of millions of people watched every week, right. and it was it, it was a big deal. You know, you you say Archie Bunker to a millennial these days, and you right. get a blank star, stare. But it was a, he was a major uh, cultural uh, icon of the 1970s uh, and and into the 80s. Uh, and uh, what do we have that's the equivalent of that today? Not not much, I think. No, I think that's right. It, it, I guess so. We can be thankful at the very least this technology, which is giving us this elite, is also destroying it. <laughs> and it's not a true era. And true. also, there are so many different options. You don't have to, it's not just movie stars, it's the TV, like we're saying. It's, right. it's the collective of it all means that there are fewer and fewer people who just stand out individually. And given technology in America, anybody can be of the aristocracy. Mm -hmm. Even the Kardashians. <laughs> well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> uh, thank you all. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us.